And joining me now from Houston, Texas is Paula Perez Pena, principal researcher in carbon capture at S&P Global. Paula, thanks for coming on the show. How have carbon capture projects advanced globally over the past few years in terms of the number of projects and capacity? Yeah, well, Nasser, thank you for having me. So in the past 10 years, the number of projects have been growing slowly. So we're adding between one or two projects every year. And that means that, you know, in the past 10 years, we've doubled the capacity. Now, this sounds like it's good for the industry, but we're still in a very early stage mm. of developing. We only have 30, less than 30 projects current operating globally, which is quite small for the potential that this industry has. How does the IRA Act agreed to a few days ago in the U.S. Senate impact the carbon capture industry in the U.S.? So uh, that's a good question. And let me start explaining what the IRA is. The Inflation Reduction Act is a bill that was passed by the Senate on Sunday and is looking at doing multiple things. One of them, of course, is fighting inflation, but other uh, or the thing that is important is they are providing a lot of investment for clean energy technologies. And one of them is carbon capture and sequestration. So this bill is huge because it's increasing the amount of tax credits that these projects are going to get. So the, the increased amount is up to 70% of the previous amount. And so that's going to increase the economics of the projects, improve them, but also is going to provide more time for these projects to apply to get these credits. Mm -hmm. And it's also going to reduce the, um, the capture requirements. So it just makes it easier for some developers to apply. Let us explain to our viewers, Paula, the different types of carbon capture technologies, namely uh, the differences between capture uh, or carbon capture and storage, CCS, and direct air capture, DAC, and their different applications? Sure, yeah, that's that's the classic question, uh, and it's very important. So when we talk about CCS or carbon capture and sequestration, we are talking about capturing fossil CO2 before it enters the atmosphere. So, uh, and once the CO2 is captured, it's going to be sequestered underground. So you, we are reducing CO2 emissions there. And mainly those happen from um, industrial facilities. So you're capturing the CO2 from industrial facilities before they enter the, the atmosphere. For direct air capture, the concept is a little bit different. You are actually removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So you are assuming that the CO2 is already in the in the air, in the atmosphere, and you're trying to remove the CO2. So as you can see, uh, or you can imagine, removing CO2 from air is going to be more complex than capturing mm. CO2 from an industrial facility. So it's it, the applications are completely different once one director capture removes the CO2, and the other one, the CCS reduces CO2. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a debate, Paula, about how important will carbon removal from the air and the oceans be in the fight against climate change. Some say it's a distraction from cutting emissions. Others say that reducing emissions alone won't be sufficient in hitting climate targets fast enough, and hence carbon removal has to be part of the toolkit. Why don't you weigh in here? The first thing I want to say is we are facing a big challenge that is meeting net zero targets or net zero emissions by 2050. So we need multiple technologies mm. working together to meet this target, right? That 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 implies that you know in in any of the, the scenarios that we've seen and we work with, you know, it, we will need carbon removal solutions, because there are some industries that is going to be really hard to completely eliminate the emissions um, unless we change completely the way we produce things. So uh, in our view, direct air capture and carbon removals will be needed 
But not only that, we need all the technologies to work together in, to be able to meet this, this challenge. Let's discuss direct air capture uh, more. DAC, as they call it, has always been considered by many as a very risky investment. Has that outlook changed for DAC recently, given the changes in cost structures, the funding, regulatory support, and technological uh, advancements? What is still needed, Paula, to scale this technology up? Yeah, so for direct air capture, is not different than any other cutting-edge technology, right? So at the beginning, you will find that it's quite expensive. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty around it. So uh, we still have a lot of work to do around this technology, which is new, like many others in the past. Now, um, the good news is that we are moving in the right direction. So first, we have the first larger scale project uh, operating in Europe, and we are close to have a second project here in the US that is under construction. So having larger scale projects are important for new technologies because it let us uh, understand better the cost, the, the operational challenges and mm -hmm. the technology per se, right? Mm, the other thing that is happening is um, regulation. So uh, as you mentioned, the IRA is, is an example of mm. how the government is trying to, to uh, incentivize these technologies. So in this new bill, they are giving up to $180 per ton of CO2 mm -hmm. removed to this to this technology. So it's, it's a significant uh, help for these technologies to move ahead. So th there are so there are things that are happening right now that seems to be uh, showing that the, the technology is moving in the right direction. However, they're not enough. We still need these technologies to reduce costs because they're quite expensive. We still need uh, more governments to come in and incentivize this technology if we really need to, if we really want to scale to the numbers that we need. Mm. Uh, so there is a, a long journey ahead, but we are moving in the right direction. Let's move from DAC to uh, CCS. Has the cost structure for CCS from point sources reached maturity? And at what range are these costs at currently? I'm going to start with the range of cost. Um, CCS costs vary significantly based on multiple factors. So you have to keep in into account the technology that you're using to capture the CO2, but you also need to keep into account the sector. What sector is being captured from? What is the size of the plant and the location? So there are multiple factors that play a role when we're talking about cost. Hmm. And because of that, you can imagine we'll have a big range of costs. So um, um, I can tell you like average numbers, you know, from $20 per ton of CO2 hmm. all the way to $150 per ton of CO2 for points of source capture. So it's, it's quite a big range, right? And it's because there are many things involved. Now, mm, your first question regarding the maturity of the technology, mm. right? I'll say because the, the industry is, is so complex, the, the answer to this is it depends, right? We're talking about a sector that has been capturing CO2 for many years and that uses the same technology that is a mature technology. Well, we could think of that scenario as a mature cost, mm. but Carbon capture is more than that, right? It can be applied to other sectors, like industrial sectors that don't have a lot of experience capturing CO2. Also, a lot of new technologies that have been uh, studied right now that are trying to get into the market to capture CO2 at lower costs. So for those cases, you will see that the cost maturity is not there yet. We still have a lot of a opportunities to reduce costs. Mm -hmm. Well, let's discuss more on the uh, sectorial applications of CCS. Uh, CCS, we know, can be used in cement, in steel, refineries, chemical industries, etc. But are these, are there any certain sectors where CCS from point sources make more sense than others, and why? 
So that's actually a perfect follow-up question from uh, our previous conversation. Mm -hmm. The answer is yes, there are certain sectors where CCS make more sense than others. So if you think about it, each industrial facility or process is unique. It has its own challenges and it also has different uh, ways to decarbonize or options to decarbonize. So industries where electrification or switching to a clean fuel is not possible, mm. then you will have this, you will see that CCS will play a significant role. An example of this could be an industry that, you know, generates a lot of emissions because of chemical reactions, right? It's just part of the process. So when you generate those emissions, you have two options, use CCS to capture those emissions, or you need to change the process completely, right? Uh, because there are no more options. So for those type of industries, you will see that CCS will be a better alternative than other decarbonization solutions. So uh, the industries per se will have to look into the, the portfolio of clean tech solutions and decide what mm. is better for them based on their targets. A growing number of international corporations are turning to nature-based solutions in order to offset their emissions. For example, like reforestation projects that produces carbon credits or offsets. How do such nature-based solutions stack up against carbon capture technologies in terms of decarbonization efficiency? Uh, when we talk about nature-based solutions, we have to start thinking of these solutions as capturing CO2 from the air. So they are comparable to the direct air capture solutions that we discussed mm -hmm. previously, right? And in fact, they both are classified as carbon removal solutions. So nature-based solutions and direct air capture are under the same category. Now, um, they are complementary solutions. Uh, the difference is nature-based solutions is more mature uh, it relies on nature to capture CO2, while direct air capture is a new technology early stage we're just learning about it. So because of the maturity of the solution or nature-based solutions, uh, the cost uh, is lower, right? And we have more knowledge for these, for these solutions. So it's natural that corporations are choosing these solutions that are already mature at lower cost. Um, to um, offset their emissions. Now, it's, it's important to mention, though, that nature-based solutions have limitations, right? So things like land availability, right? Uh, we will need extensive amount, uh, amount of land to be able to capture all the CO2 that we need, that we need the targets, to meet the targets. Also, how easy is to monitor the CO2 um, from, these, from these forests? on how long is gonna uh, the CO2 is gonna stay sequestered, right? What mm. happens if there is a wildfire, right? Mm. Uh, or any other nature uh, disaster that could damage the forest. So those are things that we have to keep in mind uh, when we're talking about nature-based solutions, right? Uh, so we cannot rely only on nature-based solutions. Um, we need a mix between nature-based solutions and technology-based mm -hmm. solutions. At the moment, the, the technology is not developed yet. So that's why if we want to act right now, nature-based solutions is, is, is the, the option that we have uh, to choose from. But as, as technology evolves, I think we need a mix because mm -hmm. they both complement each other. Mm -hmm. Paula Perez Pina, Principal Researcher in Carbon Capture at SP Global in Houston. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Paula. Thank you for having me.